Good afternoon. Welcome to the uh, March 2014 meeting of the Pitt County Department of Social Services Board. I'd uh, like to take a moment for silent prayer or meditation. Uh, I'd like to uh, mention again that we do have uh, opportunity for the public to provide <coughs> comments to us. Uh, this is something that uh, we all would like uh, to be used, and it gives you an opportunity to share your views and concerns. At this time, no one has signed up, is that correct? So we will continue. But I, again, would like to encourage the uh, the citizens and, uh, and other interested parties to take that opportunity to come and uh, talk with us. Uh, let's see. Next, we're going to go down to the agenda. Mr. Chairman, I move we approve the agenda as presented. Let's see. Would you hold that for a minute? I do I have. Will. I do have an addition. Okay. Uh, the addition will be that we will be discussing um, the um, possible uh, candidates. And we will do that in um, closed uh, <clears throat> session. Uh, and uh, I, I'll just mention that again um, earlier down in the um, agenda. Okay. Now, Eugene. Mr. Chairman, I move that we adopt the amended budget that has been presented. Motion has been uh, made and seconded. Now I'm looking for the second. Second. <laughs> Motion has been made and seconded. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed have the same. Okay. All right. I'd like to move on to the uh, minutes of the uh, uh, previous uh, meeting. I move that the minutes be approved as may or Mr. Chairman, if there are no corrections. And I second it. Okay. Motion has been made and seconded. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed have the same. Next, we're going to uh, move down to the next uh, area, which is matters that require board action. And uh, uh, PJ Quinn, seems like you're up at bat. Yes, sir. We received some money this since the last meeting. We've got uh, two increments from Greenville Utilities, one in the amount of $5,000 and one in the amount of $30,100 to be used for the citizens, of, the eligible citizens for the utilities. And we also got $11,284 for direct services in Smart Start Daycare. And we got $170 from the state from Progress Energy Energy Neighbor Funds to also be used by eligible Pitt County uh, people. And I don't have it on this list, but just today we received another $8,700-something for SIP allocation, crisis intervention. It's not much, but we did get a funding authorization today for that. Okay. That's all, that's all really good, and um, I, it's really good that we're, again, I, I want to uh, really thank the, the staff at Greenville uh, Utilities. They've really been uh, stepping up to the plate, and it's very seldom where um, monies come in that they've not participated and uh, made a uh, donation. So on behalf of the board and uh, citizens of Pitt County, I'd really like to thank the employees of Greenville Utilities. Mr. Chairman, do we send them a level of appreciation when they make donations uh, from the board or from? I think in the past I've sent them a letter, I think. I think it would be good that you okay. do recognize that and do send them a level of appreciation. Okay. Let them uh, know that we do appreciate it. Sure. That, that is really good. Okay. Anybody have any um, questions or issues with the uh, I just have a question. PJ, do you want us to approve that SIP allocation as well so you can go ahead and take it to the commissioners at their next meeting to put it in your budget? That would be great. Okay. Go ahead. Then I make a motion to approve these four as presented plus the SIP allocation right. so that she can get the budget it's corrected. $8,754, I think, is the dollar amount. Okay. And I second that emotion. Okay. Thank you. Motion has been... Uh, made and seconded. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed? 
And Susan, you got the exact amount of the uh, the SIP award? $8,754. Okay, great, great. Um, next, we're going to move on to um, reports um, to the board. And uh, Margaret, you're up with guardianship. Right, and we have some staff today, and Julie Petrasso from our legal staff here. Um, if you remember back in uh, February, during our quarterly reports, one of the areas that we focused on was our increase in guardianship cases. Um, so uh, there was some interest in having a little bit more information around guardianship cases, what that looks like for the agency, what, we're, what those trends are indicating. So we have a report put together by Paula Meekins and Cynthia Ross and Julia, so they'd like to kind of update you as well as the public on what that looks like in our agency. Thank you for having us. I'm Cynthia Ross. I supervise the Adult Protective Services Unit, and Paula Meekin supervises the guardianship. Essentially, I'm typically involved in the process that gets us to the adjudication of guardianship, and then she handles the ongoing maintenance of them. Um, we wanted to explain just briefly what guardianship involves. Um, guardianship services involves just the ongoing um, services that we provide to maintain an individual that the court has adjudicated incompetent. All individuals that we serve under guardianship have been through a court process to declare them legally incompetent. Um, and then some of those cases, the court has decided to give an individual um, the guardian, but in the cases we're involved in, we have been the one designated to serve as a guardian. Before we become guardian, we're required to look at all available family, um, friends, anybody interested. Uh, we are the individual of last resort. Um, we, anybody who's wanting to serve as guardian cannot be convicted of a felony. We look at other criminal records, um, searches, things like that that will make a family member un, unable to be uh, considered. We look at, it can be a church friend, longtime friend, there's no definition for relation, but we do try and find somebody who has an interest in an individual before us. Um, we look at options like advanced directives, um, if it's just money management problems, we, we try to avoid guardianship because of the pervasive, it takes away their rights to do a lot of things. Um, so those are things that we do consider before we take the step of petitioning in court for guardianship. We serve in different ways as the guardian. We serve as guardian of the person, which is like it sounds, it's basically making individuals about decisions about the individual's welfare. It is where they live, medical treatment, <coughs> Um, anything social that's involving the individual and their livelihood. Um, guardianship of the estate involves when that individual has property, um, bank accounts, things that have to be managed. There's a guardianship of the estate and then general guardian. General guardian is a combination of two. So there are times when our agency serves as guardian of the person and there is an attorney or other individual that's appointed to manage the estate if there's property that needs to be sold and things um, of that nature. Typically we try and get an attorney or other designated agency to serve, but there's if the <clears throat> estate does not have money in it, <clears throat> If the individual lives in their home and it can't be sold, if there's essentially if there's not much equity, they're still going to need to be in a state because the individual owns property. But that's how sometimes we serve when they're when it can't um, be profitable for another individual to serve. We get guardianship <clears throat> referrals in different ways. Um, there are private citizens that call us and say, um, you know, I need to become guardian of my you know, ailing mother, I need to become guardian of my disabled, uh, mentally incapacitated you know, child who's aged up and turned 18. So there's lots of different ways that we get them from the community. As people age in facilities, um, there's people living very long 
late in their years and their family members are also finding themselves aged and unable to serve. So we get some people in nursing homes who have no families that's able to make medical decisions for them. So we get them from that area. Um, we get them from mental health, private community organizations where an individual is suffering from some type of mental disorder and it, their company who's working with them feels like they need a guardian, ECBH sometimes will make reports about an individual who is not able to make decisions so they can't sign consents for services that are available to them. We'll get reports in that way. <coughs> we certainly get reports from the court system. There's individuals and in, you know that may be going through the criminal court system and the judges keep seeing them and does, do not feel like they can understand the legal processes and keep seeing them coming in. We'll get referrals through the court system that way. We'll get referrals from our clerk of court when a situation gets presented to the clerk and she feels like you know she would like our agency to assess the need for guardianship and all substantiated adult protective services cases that we sub that we seek an adult protective services court order the law requires us if we determine that they lack capacity and need a judge to give consent for protective services we're required to take the next step and assess their need for a permanent guardian as adult protective services is just a temporary 60-day order so a lot of our cases that we serve in came out of that service arena. In the time I've been working here, the population that we're serving as guardian has changed dramatically. Um, we felt like it was important to let you know what types of population we're serving. Currently, we have 71 wards that we're serving. Um, 66 of those are guardian of the person. Predominantly, we try to only serve in guardian of the person and try not to involve in the financial affairs because there's a lot of additional legal entanglements um, in selling property and, and managing those things. Um, this number reflects a 48% increase. So we've almost doubled the numbers that we were serving in 2010. Um, many people think that everybody who we're guardian of is living in a facility and that's not so anymore. Um, 13 of those 71 are living independently in the community, so there's a lot of services involved in trying to help somebody stay in their home. 29 of those are under the age of 30. Um, I felt like it was important for y'all to know, you know, these individuals that we're bringing in that are young, we're going to have for, you know, hopefully they live long lives. Hopefully with our interventions we're able to let them live to their fullest extent, but these are individuals who we could easily be serving the next 50 years. And so as we're getting more and more younger guardians, there's not ones, there's not as many passing away. So that's how our numbers continue to grow. Um, 42 out of 71 of them have primary diagnosis of mental illness or developmentally disabled. So a lot of them are not our aged individuals <laughs> living in nursing homes. Um, that's not what our population is looking like primarily in guardianship anymore. <clears throat> um, there's a lot of reasons why our population's changing. You know, one is fairly obvious. We've, I've talked before when I've presented to y'all reports about adult services and why our numbers are growing. People are living longer. Um, like I said, you know, if I'm 90 in a facility, chances are my children who would typically be looked at to make decisions are also aging and not able to. Um, people are living in the community with mental illness, um, but they're not able to manage all of the affairs to, to maintain stability in the community. Um, in 2012, there were some legislative changes that changed <coughs> who we did guardianship and how we did it. There was a time that the county kind of divided them up. People who were had a primary di diagnosis of mental health went to the, the mental health center. Those who had a primary diagnosis of physical illness, physical ailment, went to the health department. And DSS kind of caught the others that, that fell in the gaps or had multiple um, problems. Now we are the only disinterested public agency authorized to serve. So every time we substantiate the need for protective services, petition the court for an adult protective services court order, if we move forward with guardianship, if we can't identify family that's appropriate or individuals that are appropriate, we, we are the only option now to look to. Um, the hospital um, brings us a lot of our guardianship cases. Being a regional hospital, there's people who are homeless, not rooted in other communities. They end up at our regional hospital, whether it be we have a 
DD unit here in the behavioral health unit that is not, there's not very many across the state. So there's lots of reasons why our hospital regionally kind of gets people in that aren't necessarily sent back to the community that they came from. So there are some that we get that are returning to that community. Even if we're not doing guardianship right then, they're ending up discharged to placements, you know, different, different things in Pitt County and um, subsequently we're ending up serving. Um, I wanted to show you that there's a lot of social work involved, a lot of time intensity um, has changed in what we're doing with our wards. When we, pretty much when we handle guardianship and the majority of them were living in facilities, we had to check on them, we had to go to meetings, we had to talk to doctors, but their day-to-day -day needs were taken care of. We know they were fed, we know that they had clothing, um, and we were not having to be involved as intimately as we are now with the wards that we have living independently. Like I said, 13 that are living independently. Um, it, it takes a lot to manage a household, and you're doing everything, and you've got to make sure they have food, and you've got to make sure you can't trust that they have food because you gave them money to go shopping. There are some individuals that we're actually having to buy the food to make sure that food is purchased and make sure that they're safe. So there's a, um, a lot of intensive work involved, a lot of social work time involved. There's transportation out there to get them to the doctor, but we have to go with them. We have to make sure that that care um, at the doctor's office is secured and information is given correctly to the doctor. Um, and those individuals living in the community tend to have difficulties that we've got to be there to support them. Um, we are asked to keep people in the least restrictive environment, so we really do try those that can be successful and that we can ensure their safety. Um, that's, that's what we try and do with individuals to support their independence, but it, it's time intensive with the work. Um, certainly, like in all areas, the level of difficulty for guardianship is increasing. Um, people are having comorbid um, diagnosis. People aren't just physically sick anymore. There's a lot of mental illnesses intermingled with those. Um, there's a lot of dual diagnosed individuals out there that are, have mental illness and um, mental retardation. <clears throat> um, some of them multiple interacting uh, diagnoses. And it makes the social worker having to be an expert or try to be an expert on everything that's 18 years old and those things that people are facing and difficulties at 18 and 81. So what a, what a social worker is being asked to kind of uh, know is, is increasing. Um, Noncompliance with medications and the complications that involve that. We have a lot of cases that come out of people who historically are noncompliant with their medications. And the longer the noncompliance goes on, the more difficult treatment options are. Um, and it makes, you know, where we are with somebody and what we're trying to do difficult. Um, now we'll ask, I guess, turn it over to Julie Petrasso to kind of bring you in and, and where we stop or, or how we're intermingled with the legal process and how our work and our changes and increases affects the legal department. Good afternoon. My name is Julie Petrasso. I am an attorney for the Department of Social Services. I've been serving in that capacity since 2009. Um, just to give you a brief overview of what my life is like as the uh, one of the adult services attorneys, um, essentially there is two avenues for the most part that we um, can take when we get an adult services referral from Cynthia's unit. Um, there is an adult protective services route we can go, which is under Statute 108. Uh, alternatively, there is a guardianship under 35. Mm -hmm. um, and adult services, uh, under the adult services provision, uh, we're required to give uh, five days notice in order to conduct a hearing. We have to prove by uh, clear coaching convincing evidence that the respondent is in fact disabled and neglected and in need of protective services. Where this is coming up a lot is through the hospital. Um, recently, Margaret Dixon, myself, Cynthia Paula, the clerk of court, uh, the chief district court judge, and um, some members of the hospital staff met on this issue. As Cynthia po uh, pointed out, um, with the increase in volume of the, the hospital that they are serving, we are getting pulled into those figures 
figures and those numbers. Um, folks are being held um, at the hospital because of uh, behavioral health issues, among other issues, and um, they are in need of a long-term plan, and there are no family members or friends in those circumstances that are able to accommodate those plans. As such, uh, they contact the adult services unit and uh, legal is contacted in hopes that we may make appropriate arrangements. Ultimately, this uh, frequently leads to a guardianship path. Um, in terms of the guardianship path, we're required to give 10 days notice. Uh, the clerk of courts has exclusive uh, jurisdiction over matters regarding guardianships. Um, and in order to prove <coughs> that somebody uh, is in need of a guardianship, we have to prove, again, by clear cogent and convincing evidence uh, that the person is unable to manage their own affairs and is unable to communicate important decisions to a decision maker that could help them in facilitating making those plans. As uh, Cynthia has posted out, because of the increase in the volume um, in terms of both of the adult protective services uh, referrals we're getting and the guardianship referrals we are getting, um, it is causing uh, we try to stay on top of the, uh, on top of the numbers, uh, and we are required to by statute. But it is becoming a significant role in terms of the legal department. When I started in 2009, um, under the guidance of uh, Janice Gallagher and Lisa Overton, um, my observation in the last three or four years is that there's been a substantial increase since that time. Um, and I would say that in terms of uh, the imminence of circumstances that are arising. I mean, we've had to do a number of uh, emergency APS orders, um, ex parte emergency orders, because as Cynthia pointed out, we have such a young population. Um, and in fact, uh, it, we have a population coming straight out of foster care that's going straight into these guardianships. And these are young adults, and they uh, have been exposed to uh, volatile situations historically and making the transition to adulthood uh, is a significant one. Uh, as such, um, they put themselves at risk and they put others at risk. And making that transition sometimes requires us to take um, APS orders that are imminent as well as interim guardianships which only require service prior to the hearing. If we do an interim guardianship which only requires just service right prior to the hearing, we are proceeding under the belief that the person will, in fact, be adjudicated and competent at some point, um, which requires more work on the social work, on the social worker's part. Um, clear code and convincing evidence is close to the highest burden um, that is required by law, and so the social workers certainly have their work cut out for them. Um, <clears throat> During a hearing, my expectation, the clerk's expectation is that they have not only medical evidence, but they've interviewed the respondent themselves, they've talked to medical health providers, they've talked to neighbors, they've talked to family members. Frequently, we have to subpoena uh, family members, friends, neighbors, things of that nature to come and testify at these proceedings. Um, we also, it's required by statute that the social worker make contact with collaterals, um, reach out to family members to see if uh, the family members will serve in the capacity of guardian of the person, general guardian, uh, and sometimes guardian of the estate. And this requires a, a lot in terms of the social work end of things. So um, while it has impacted uh, legal as well, um, I have to say that uh, the, social, the social workers really bear the brunt of it. Um, and uh, in Paula's unit, once it gets transferred to her, as she stated, she's responsible to maintain these 18, 19-year-olds potentially for the remainder of their lives. Um, and as you can imagine, in terms of just status reports, just in terms of making a, a monthly visit and making that face-to-face -face contact, that's a substantial amount of work, especially when you consider that that may go on for 60 or 70 years. Um, and as the only uh, public appointment right now, um, we are certainly feeling the brunt of it um, since that shift in 2012. So. Um, that is all I have to say, and I will uh, turn it back over to Cynthia for any questions. Um, I was going to say one thing. Um, <clears throat> uh, I really uh, appreciate your work, and um, as you know, I have a, another side of me, and, and that's at the hospital. I guess you've read millions of my reports. <laughs> and uh, initially, that's what really got me involved with social services when I was seeing um, the kinds of issues uh, that were going on. And I've been doing this for quite a while, and, and I would really be amiss if I didn't say how great um, Cindy Acevedo is. 
she's been extremely helpful um, in terms of getting things done, moving things along, letting me know things. And I've been doing this for a long time, and, and there has been a tremendous increase, a, a lot on the, the medical side, as you said, from understanding medical issues, from noncompliance to emergency kinds of things. And, and I really think that you've um, done a good job. In, in, the, in the world where you could, you know, really make all the changes you'd want, what kinds of things would you like to see done? What, how could we help you out? Um, I think what Pitt County essentially is missing in trying to meet the needs of this population is um, places for individuals with disabilities to live. Um, it's pervasive in our catchment area for ECBH that there's just not. Mm -hmm. We are having to send individuals um, many counties over, a long, often a long way away from here, and we can't keep our hands on them and make sure that individuals are safe. So we are really missing on um, service arenas, uh, group homes, um, anything that would serve that population for housing, not independent living so much because many of them can't. If we can maintain them in an apartment with services, we try. <clears throat> but for people who need placement from age 18 <laughs> on up, um, until they reach the age where they would be appropriate for an assisted living, uh, group home living environment. If I had, could wave a magic wand and look <coughs> at placements for individuals, that would be a, a big progress, whether it's in the developmentally delayed arena, but it's in the, with the mental health diagnosis, mental illness diagnosis, we just don't have placements. We don't have places to put people. And so there's a big mismatch. We're putting people with mental illness into adult care homes, places, um, and it's just not good. <laughs> We're doing the best we can with that. Um, often we, we may have to have people in the community with relatives who can't meet their needs, but so we're putting people sometimes in the best that's available, but not optimal for somebody's mental health. So that would be the first area I would say would be placements for individuals. Um, certainly services, um, that, that has changed. What does it mean there's not true mental health case management out there. Our social workers are not mental health case managers, but that's what they're out there trying to do. So they're not, um, they're not trained. You can send them to a workshop, but in order for somebody to meet the, to have the knowledge to serve somebody from 18 to 88 <laughs> and understand those medical diagnoses, understand all those mental illnesses, um, like Ms. Patressa said, some of these kids who are aging out of foster care, um, to understand all of those diagnoses <clears throat> and, and all of those, um, that, that's a lot of wealth of information. So um, training is there. Certainly we, we do have the opportunity to go to training, but um, you can't have them in training every week, mm -hmm. every month. Mm -hmm. So that's um, difficult. Mm -hmm. um, those are two of the biggest areas. All right, you, Eugene, you have a question? Yes. I know there's a lot of Down syndrome people in Pitt County. And they have to have some uh, guardian. I know it's a fact. How many do we have? And, and that, that number kind of surprised me as being so low, because these Down syndromes, I mean, they are they are the sweetest <clears throat> people there is on this earth. I know. But how many do you keep up a record of? How many and how many of them? Because all of them need special help. All the. All the 71 that we have, I'm not aware of any of them having a Down syndrome diagnosis. Well, so it's not. You? There are that, many people with disabilities out there in the community. That you that, don't. Right. Like I was a guardian for one, so I know what I'm talking about. Right. They, there are many people who are disabled who are not adjudicated incompetent. If a physician's working with somebody, they may always let mom, you know, make decisions for them without no, any legal authority. That's the way. And so, that was the reason I was wondering the courts did this. And evidently you all were not involved in this mm -hmm. because it went on for 30, 40 years yeah. that we I was involved in We are certainly not involved um, in everybody. <laughs> I, I think some of these um, individuals with developmental disabilities, as their parents age, well, we, that's we what, will get them That's what happened in this case. <clears throat> so you all don't get involved at all. In we haven't today. had any referrals. Not until, not until. So it, because I was just wondering how many 
really that work because I know there's a for the most part there's some unmet need that starts our involvement it, it, there is some that they can't access medical treatment they're not able to live independently there's usually it's coming to Department of Social Services because something's not working right in their life well you know their lifespan is no ways as long as the ordinary person mm -hmm. if you talk to the doctors their lifespan may be 60 years of age and uh, Depend still, upon that care, I learned that too. I learned a lot. That saying. would still be 40 years of us working with somebody. Oh, so yes, it's I went longer, long than, longer than that, really, now, because they have potential to have. potential certainly there that we'll get a Down syndrome <clears throat> individual, but at the present time, we <clears throat> are not currently serving any Down syndrome. Yeah, and, and, like, and like they said, a lot of times there will be a parent or someone that will take care of them, and they won't have to come in to the system. Because usually what happens, they come into this system when the original system, the biological system, has failed and then we have to, in a sense, step in. So that, that really says that a lot of uh, family members and relatives are stepping in and taking care of that special population. I, I think maybe on Down syndrome, they probably do that more than they do any of them because they know from the time they are born that somebody has got to care for them. Okay. You gonna, That's what I thought. Are you going to say something? Can you tell the board how care coordination has changed since uh, mental health sent all the people that they were guardianship for here is one thing. Um, and did you get any additional staff when you got those people? Changed since when? Since um, they went to uh, MCO and they transferred the people that they were guardianship of over here. Um. We at one time, um, even since the mental health centers closed, we at one time could use ARC and ECBH would fund that. So we would call and say, you know, this person is a little bit too complicated for us. Their um, mental health needs are, are very, very complicated. And we would ask for an alternative individual and ECBH would fund that. So we were not involved with, you know, we, we handled the uh, guardianship process, but the, it was funded. So an agency was paid. Um, we are now providing we, we are, I don't have that availability. If I have a very complicated, you know, we have some that have aged out of foster care recently and we have some coming that we just don't know how, what we're gonna do. Um, but those are cases that we would in the past have given and somebody else would have funded and an expert in that area would have been there to access services for them. Um, we don't um, typically have care coordination for our cases. Um, care coordination is a service that ECBH can provide if an individual gets what used to be called CAP MR, if they get that, they do have care coordinators. Um, but care coordination, th that is not hands-on. They don't meet those people. They don't know those people. They are looking at diagnostic criteria and matching diagnosis with services. Um, so it's, it's, it's there, but they are not serving the majority of our guardianship cases. And did you get any additional staff when you got the additional? <clears throat> yeah. And it, it, it wasn't high in numbers, essentially, from the start. What the biggest impact for us is those that we used to be able to hand off, whether, you know, we can't. So since 2010 and where the numbers back then, um, we don't have that option. So our numbers of who needs to be have a guardian is greater, and there's not. A shared responsibility for that so we we haven't had any um staff increase in those cases some uh, positions in-house based on that that were mostly uh at risk medicaid and kind of developed our own but to me uh, this is an area worth watching in terms of capacity our capacity to continue to take cases and take cases so it's a, a fragile area that we need to watch um it, since we are the only community alternative for that um, which is one of the reasons we felt it important to bring to you to watch these trends um, in addition to the point that they make that um, the social workers are asked to do above and beyond what their current capabilities are in terms of training and, and managing so that's an area that we want to really look at maybe we need mental health workers on staff instead yeah, of yeah, social I, workers, you know. So I think there's a picture that's really evolving and and paying close attention to it, I think, is really important. Um, 
as we continue to get capacity the... in many areas of our agency. Yeah. So. Our numbers have increased. I don't <clears throat> think the numbers bother me as much as the intensity, intensity. of the cases. Mm -hmm. How about resources? Do you have the same resources today that you had Probably less. Ten, 10 years <laughs> ago? We don't. I mean, there even five years ago or even two years ago, the community mental health support that was available is just so reduced. I mean, you used to have, um, it's hard to get somebody approved for even a day program. There's not partial hospitalization. Anybody who's been around here, everything that we used to know as what was available for people in the community is not. Everything is time intensive. Well, these individuals, um, mental illness, difficulties increases over time, doesn't decrease, but services are time limited um, through mental health unless it's DD services, unless it's developmentally disabled. But in that mental illness arena, um, the whole resource, there are no resources. We don't have mentally, mental ill licensed homes here. We it's don't not, have, um, it's, it's an area. It's been my experience since the advent of MCOs that they pushed the private vendors out of business with all the infrastructure that they placed on them. And so they really struggle, you know. And of course, the MCOs, uh, they shut down about four o'clock or whenever, four or five o'clock. And as everybody knows, emergencies don't happen from eight to five. And so even if they could be assistance, they're not available, they're not on call, there's nobody there to, to assist them. So. It, it is quite a challenge, and that's something I agree with Margaret. I see it as, as a growing challenge. But um, the, the real issue is how do you find resources? How do you find housing? How do you find the specialized uh, psychiatric services you need? And um, my previous experience many years ago, we, we had a day treatment program. We had psychiatry. We had uh, behavioral health services. And if we could watch people on a daily basis and put them in these programs, if they started having symptoms, we could adjust their medication. If they broke through a little bit, we could put them into behavioral health. We called it inpatient back then for a couple of days. That doesn't exist anymore. It, these ladies are faced with a monumental task trying to trying to manage this population and do what they're doing. Sure. I, I as, 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 as I mentioned, I'm, I may do four or five a week and um, I, I see the, the issues uh, between uh, mental health, physical illness, um, poor compliance, and, and, and I'm trained in the area, and I review it, and as I would explain it to, you know, in most instances, Cynthia, um, she's kind of, you know, she'll call me, well, what does this mean? What is, how does this affect this? And, and so I try to write my report to show how these things fit together and what kinds of issues there are. So it's, it's very hard for a non-mental health professional to see the implications, issues, and, and treatment um, requirements, as well as prognosis for these cases. So it, that's a lot that you guys have to serve and to have no direct mental health services available is, is very, very difficult. Well, I'd like to thank you for all your, your work, and I really uh, appreciate you coming forth to share this information. Okay. We're going to move on to the uh, technology report. Okay. Okay. All right. We've been working really hard at, in social services and MIS and trying to uh, upgrade our ability to provide um, services. Um, <clears throat> to our clients and also to assist workers in trying to be able to do their job um, better. Right now we have, um, you on your list have eight different projects that we're working on, but I want to add one to that um, on the end of the report. Mm -hmm. But right now we're working um, with Mr. Hardik Patel uh, and Mr. Mike Taylor um, we're working toward uh, front desk uh, document management analysis, the DSS, and what we want to do with this is we want to be able that when documents are mailed in to us that they can be scanned in and attached to a case, to the NCFAST case, 
so that workers, when they pull up that case and they're looking for a document, they can already have that document in the system. Um, and then we have the NCFAST technology, which is ongoing analysis of our needs for NCFAST. And we have been um, doing that analysis be since June of uh, <coughs> 2013, and that is going to be ongoing with us as we uh, go through NCFAST and we add on um, different areas to NCFAST. So that will be something that we will continue throughout the NCFAST project. Um, then we have the LEAP um, uh, program. LEAP is off-site this year, and um, they are in a, um, that program is, is in a non-county building, and they are not set up with the county network. So MIS has to continue to support the hardware that is in that building in order for those LEAP workers to be able to do their jobs. We have the NC FAST application log tracking, which is another area we're working on. We're trying to enhance the ability of the Medicaid supervisors and the food stamp supervisors to be able to track the um, applications that come into the agency and um, be able to know what the due dates are uh, and where that application is in the process of um, providing services to that client. So we're trying to add to that log. We're also working toward an NCFAST kiosk area over at the Human Service Center, and this will be an area where that clients can use or customers can use. They can come in and they will be able to complete an application for right now for food stamps or Medicaid prior to seeing the worker. And then that application will um, go directly to the caseworker so that that application is completed before they go back to talk with the worker. Um, we're also looking at an NCFAST training room and um, setting up a training room at the Human Services Center that Medicaid and food stamp caseworkers can use for ongoing training as well as when new caseworkers are hired that they can also be trained uh, and we will have the equipment and the ability to train those workers um, in a room <coughs> there at the Human Services Center. We're also um, um, looking at, we've also purchased laptops um, that caseworkers can use to um, input cases um, from home. We, last weekend, we had three caseworkers that were able to take laptops home over the weekend, and they were able to input their um, applications from home, and we were able to <laughs> see how that would work with um, them working outside of the agency. Um, we also are <coughs> going to be looking at, as we see uh, success with them um, doing applications at home, maybe some of the workers during a period of time during the day working from home and putting applications in, where they would be able to be away from the phone and be able to get their work done. Um, so. Um, the laptops were very successful last weekend, and we hope to continue to be able to do that. Um, we're also looking at um, two applications from Johnston County um, to help us with our Medicaid <coughs> transportation and our CPS program. And last Monday, March 3rd, um, employees <coughs> from <coughs> from uh, Johnston County came and demonstrated both of those applications um, to the supervisors in terms of um, the CPS application and how that would work in terms of investigating CPS reports, um, accessing information from the field when it's needed, communicating with the supervisors out in the field. Um, <coughs> and also, this application would also um, help us to create a log for those three by five cards that we've talked about also, to um, create a log that would be able to um, link up families and 
for us to know the history on families and who are the family members, extended family members involved in those systems, in our CPS system. So we looked at both of those applications from Johnston County and uh, currently MIS is um, beginning the steps of working with Johnston County to look at those applications to see um, how they can be used um, possibly here in Pitt County to help us with the work that we do here. Um, what you do not have on the technology report is um, what we're working toward in terms of what we um, call our hunt group. The hunt group is a group that will be used to assist in answering some of the un some of the calls that have <coughs> gone unanswered in the um, in in the county. We know that we have numerous calls that come into the agency that go unanswered, and you have the telephone log um, that shows that um, each month. But we're working with MIS to develop a hunt group, and that hunt group will consist of 15 people who have been named that once the call comes in to the reception area and it rings and reception does not pick up, it will automatically roll, start to rotate among the 15 people in the hunt group. Um, and once it's, ha it's answered, that call is answered by someone in the hunt group, they will have a list of different um, additional hunt groups within each unit, like CPS will have a hunt group within their unit, adult services will have a hunt group within their unit, um, daycare will have a hunt group within their unit. And once those 15 people pick up that call, they can transfer the call on to those additional hunt groups that will be able to answer the questions that folks may, the individual questions that <coughs> folks may have that they need to ask folks. So that's another thing that we're trying to set up in order to alleviate some of the pressure of the phone calls that are coming into the agency. And that's being developed at this time. It's not in place right now, but <coughs> it will be in place very soon. I uh, one of the th um, I guess I had a couple of things I wanted to bring up. Anybody have some things? I can start. Okay. I guess the um, first thing is is with the um, NC Fast technology. Um, how do you know? So like I'm, I'm still get a lot of uh, computer a lot of uh, messages. Um, how you know like with a patch? Just as an example, how would we know when we need more hardware? Or how do we know when we need to really go above and, above and beyond what is, is normal to make that change? Um, Hardy, does Patel, Hardy does that? Yeah, okay. Hardy That'll Patel be, and um, Mr. <clears throat> Taylor all along have worked with us to look at, to analyze exactly what it is that we would need for um, NC fans and um, current what you're talking about the, the notices that you're getting are mm -hmm. about the workarounds oh okay um, and um, that is uh, purely um, a state thing the mm -hmm. workarounds is but doesn't and that affect us because it does it changes affect, it, it what does we affect do. us uh -huh. but all that we all that we can do is to either try to um, follow the instructions of the workaround because there's a problem in the um, information getting through the system. So that workaround is what the state has developed in order, of us, in order for us to go around that problem and to be able to do our work. Sometimes I do know that if we ourselves um, look at the workaround, we can develop we sometimes see our own ways That's of, better. Yes, of getting the job mm -hmm. done sometimes. One thing I can add is that um, <clears throat> we've had Google Chrome added as an option for processing in NC Fast, and ah. sometimes that works faster yes. 
uh, in, uh, caseworker can switch over and process using that using Google Chrome, and it has shown to uh, be faster, and they've had good uh, results with that. So that's one other thing that's been done. Okay. All right. Um, the other th Let me see yeah. about mm -hmm. it, these laptops too. I'm really excited about that. Um, before people would have to stay in the office at nights or on weekends and you can send up to 10 people and let them do their work from home or at nights on weekends they have extended the hours now too that people will be able they were shutting down at what 7 30 Brian that's right and they've, they've taken it out to 9 from 5 in the morning till 9, nine. so if you have a you're able to do a lot of the catch-up work without necessarily having to be be there in the mm -hmm. building it it may bear even further expansion because you get um, you get people trained people and you get your best people working and most productive people working on on that and you get <coughs> a lot more productivity mm -hmm. out of that than trying to train somebody new all the time and we're able to reimburse them and keep track of their hours and yes okay all right. I guess the last, just the two comments, the training room really is, um, I, I, I think that's a good idea, and that's, I'm glad you work on that, as well as the um, using some things that are already uh, around, which are the um, using Johnston County kinds of things that you're aware of. So I, I really um, appreciate this report. The training room will allow us to train people, but it will also allow us to retrain people, and we are we are measuring everybody's productivity every day. I think, Margaret, you probably started that, didn't you? Yeah, yeah. And, um, but we're doing a better job of measuring now um, what people are doing every day. And when you know who the highest producers are and we know who the lowest producers are, mm -hmm. and sometimes those lowest producers need retraining. Um, and certainly we can find out if they can get to a median level of capacity or not. In, in a fair and impartial way. And so I'm real excited about that too. Um, but also think it'll, we'll also be able to train additional employees up there. And one person can do it as opposed to maybe positioning them with the more experienced worker and pulling their productivity down too. So it, it adds a lot of flexibility, but I was really excited to see how much uh, those two individuals were able to do last weekend, and, and I think it's uh, certainly a way to increase our capacity. Kind of like you're able to do a lot more work away from office without phones, calls, and things like that. And I have, I have spoken to the employees that took the laptops out. They're excited about it. Uh, they found it to be the processing with those to be faster than you know, being on the server here using the desktops in-house. Uh, they were they're they're very pleased with that um, Im implementation of that. Okay. We we talked mm -hmm. about then, yeah, uh, as Ms. Burns said, the possibility of identifying people to go in, home after lunch, taking laptops with them and working with working doing that. People that do reviews that don't require face to face mm -hmm. face to face contact with the client and measure that productivity as opposed to what they've been doing since we have these baselines now. What that, what that would be, mm -hmm. if they were more productive doing that or not. Um, okay. Margaret, did you, you, you started the uh, NC Fast tracking log? Was that something you had started or asked for? No, that was something that had been in the works for a while that mm -hmm. Margaret was working on when NC Fast had to get a handle on who registered at the front mm -hmm. desk and who actually made an application, those kinds of things, and track what was coming into the But I remembered you had done something with it, I thought. We were trying to add some. Yeah. No, I was just saying that was, I, I really appreciate that because I think that was something the supervisors had asked about earlier we on. We were just kind of working on some enhancements. With sure, them. and I think that was a really good idea, and I just wanted to, they also um, went to Johnson County to, mm -hmm. Mr. Merritt took them to Johnson County because when the state people were here, there are other agencies that use the reception piece with, that's mm -hmm. built into NC FAST. So I think that's still being looked at. Um, sure, yeah. 
but I just knew that you had been involved in that I wanted, and I had been looking at that and following that, so I appreciate that follow-up. Anybody else has anything else? I kind of monopolized that because I had been focusing on this. Okay. All right. Well, that's, that's great. That's great. We're going to move on to the um, Northwoods presentation. Is that next? No, we're going to have more talk about technology. Yeah, <laughs> yippee. <laughs> more technology. I just want to say I know that you can probably reflect back in February. Um, we sh presented with you a kind of a business analysis, and that analysis was, you know, a program analysis so that you could learn that real ins and outs of mm -hmm. um, what the child welfare staff needed to do and what they encounter on a daily basis and those kinds of things. Um, wanted to get the conversation out on the table about technology. I mean, I think we're at a point now where, we, where it's all over us. It's across the river, it's here, um, and we needed to move forward with that conversation. So we, and, and look at pulling together what, and develop kind of a technology plan, um, you know, as we move forward. So we're looking, this is an opportunity to look at options uh, it was great to have Ms. Mr. Merritt's former staff in Johnson County. Obviously, they recognized for uh, two years the need for technology, especially in child welfare. We really appreciated them sharing um, the technology. At the same time, we're looking at another uh, to see what options are out there. There's many things to consider. There's a uh, um, Still, the, I think it's alive and well that there's possibilities of having um, a child welfare piece with NC Fast. So, I mean, there's a lot to consider, but I think if, <clears throat> if we don't start at this point and move forward and have these conversations, um, we, we need to keep it moving. So this is kind of the track that we're taking, kind of to develop what can we do this year and maybe add next year. Um, so we've invited at your suggestion, Northwoods, to come back to talk about what it is their product can do and how it can help us now that we've kind of identified some of the issues and problems um, that plague child welfare workers in getting documentation done and being effective in their work and focusing more on serving families than being slave to uh, paper. So thank you. For coming and, back. And, uh, Mike Drabeck again with Northwoods. Um, just want to say I sincerely appreciate the opportunity to come back. Um, appreciate the opportunity in February to give you a high level view of who Northwoods is, the work we've done in the state. Um, since then, um, have had the opportunity to continue to work with Margaret and Tamitha, um, and also a number of your supervisors as well as we did an analysis of what software hardware components um, the workers potentially would need if you went down the path of implementing Northwoods in Child Protective Services. Um, you know, I have the utmost respect um, for their dedication and commitment um, to keeping the family and children's children of Pitt <laughs> County safe. Um, you could just see during the meeting their desire um, to enhance their processes, how they can work more efficiently, not only here in the office, but outside um, <clears throat> in the field as well. Um, also had a chance to talk to uh, Mr. Taylor afterwards as well, um, and we were able to confirm that our technology is in line with the infrastructure that's currently in place with Pitt County. Um, commend his effort for the infrastructure network that he has in place. Um, sorry about that. Um, in place so it fits nicely in. Um, and just wanted to come back today um, to provide a high level demonstration of the work Northwoods does, the solution that's implemented in 32 agencies in here in North Carolina. Um, I know you guys were talking about needs within economic services. While we're in 32 counties, and I know there's 100 in North Carolina, those 32 counties we're in represent 60 to 65 percent of the food nutrition services caseloads in the state. So we're only in 32 percent, but that's a, they're larger counties um, with significant challenges and needs such as Pitt County. Um, so as I talked about last time, we work in all program areas, not only economic services, so food nutrition services, Medicaid program areas. We also work in child support um, and then obviously child protective services and adult protective services. Um, your neighbor to the east here, Beaufort County, um, has implemented our solution set across their entire agency. They're actually using our mobile tablet application out in the field to begin that data collection. As Ms. Burns said, you guys are looking for a solution to capture documents as they come in through the mailroom or they're dropped off or capturing that data out in the field. We have that solution 
and it's been proven in North Carolina for seven years now um, within a multitude of counties that I had spoken with. Um, but just want to get started. <laughs> if you do have any questions, please feel free to interrupt. I'll try to keep this to 10 or 15 minutes. Um, you know, one of the things I want to point out initially is just the look and feel. Um, as I talked about last time, this is all we do. We only work with human services agencies. We understand your caseworkers, social workers have a number of tasks they need to get accomplished in the day-to-day -day processes. Um, so to implement some sort of cumbersome solution that requires multiple steps to do their activities, user adoption is going to be very low. So we've created a very simple, straightforward solution to use. Our training is very hands-on, detailed training. Um, we, want to, we want to, when we leave an agency, Everybody feels comfortable using the solution, um, and that's why we have that extra layer of classroom training and then support not only inside the agency, but if they go with our mobile tablet solution as well, out in the field with them. We'll actually do ride-alongs with them as they're going to do safety assessment, in-home investigations, things along those lines. Um, our solution is very client-centric. Um, so as you talked about the challenges, Margaret said, with the 3 by 5 index cards, we have no way to track client information. So the first component I'm going to show is our People Master Client Index. Um, basically, I can come in here and search on a number of criteria, first, last name, social security number, case number. Um, I can do a wild card search. Um, so if I only know maybe there's ROD in their last name, I can do a star ROD, and it brings back all the hits with that, those three letters in that order um, in the database. Um, the database is only active cases for Pitt County or that particular county we're working in in North Carolina. <coughs> Um, so I'll just do a search here. I'll just search on um, social security number. So we're going to work with Henry Anderson here. So I'll just do search. Um, because I had a defined field I can search on, um, it brought back exactly Henry Anderson. Um, so I'll click on his name. You can see that he has dependents in his case. His name's actually bolded because he's head of case. We also set a member alert with that flag. Um, very beneficial for a CPS social worker. Maybe last time we went into that home, this person was violent. We'd want to mark that in the case so we know next time we go out into that home, hey, this person was violent. Maybe we need <coughs> the county sheriff with us. Or we just need, a, we need that alert to know. Um, in agencies that are using this across multiple program areas, you can see that there's different tabs for the other program benefits that they're receiving. So that sharing of information is huge across agencies. Um, you know, common documents, case notes, activities related to that client, all that information is contained in here. So we have a very basic member summary, member details. So, um, like I said, the uh, member <laughs> alerts we can set here, and I apologize for the resolution. Um, we can build relationships. So maybe Henry and his wife are divorced. The kids live with Henry, but we also want to relate them to the case um, with his, his, their uh, mother. We can build relationships and show that correlation as well. Um, we have the address, not only physical, but if they have a, a P.O. box as well, employment status, marital status, um, and we can also include a picture of that client as well as part of the active case record. Um, we can keep notes on that individual or narratives on the entire case. Um, obviously, this information could be very confidential if it's a CPS-related case, um, so we can secure that data that only the appropriate people with access rights and permissions could view that information, and it wouldn't be able to be seen by everybody with access in the, in the agency. Um, from this screen, I'm actually able to do anything I want um, for Henry Anderson. So if I want to go scan a document for him, I just click on the scanner here, and it's going to take us to our capture application, and this is where I scan documents. Now, since Henry has multiple cases, we can select which worker or both workers that we want to route this document to once it's scanned into the case record. So if I select both, um, it'll populate his index values. And what I mean by index values is how we're going to identify the document. So we're going to identify the document based on four or five criteria. So once it's actually scanned into the system, I have multiple ways to find that information. It's also time and date stamped when it's scanned in for auditing purposes as well. Um, we can also see who's going to get notified of this document. Um, so this person has open cases with case manager Northwoods and case manager Michael Drabeck. They're going to be notified in their task tracker, hey, this document or this application came in. You may have 48 hours. You may have seven days. You may have 15 days. You may have 30 days, depending on which program you're in, to respond to this application. And as a supervisor, you can actually monitor your worker's task to making sure 
um, a report, an investigation report is followed up with if it's 24 hours or 48 hours, if it's an expedited food stamp interview may, or ex, expedited food stamp case, seven days you have to have it um, app, uh, processed by. So that's all part of the task that I'll click into. Um, here in the middle is what we refer to as a taxonomy or how we organize the documents. Um, so if I click on, you know, we'll just click on uh, personal information here, the personal identification. It lists all the indi individual documents that would fall under that section of the case file. So we actually scan the document down to the document level. It's all about making it easier to find. Can I ask the question? You said you only, only active cases. You Correct. said, right. Correct. So if someone had, had a case earlier and it's gone or settled or whatever, you, ha you can't get to that? Well, if they're in the system, so if they were active, became... Mm -hmm. um, Whatever happened, yeah. it, it was yeah, settled. They'll still be in the system. They'll I'm, still I'm, be in the system. Yeah, I'm, we go with a day forward approach. So we would bring, we can get a data download from NC Fast of all your active cases. So we wouldn't bring in any inactive. So when they come back in, we would start them from that day forward. But if oh, you in, have access to the in, to those that are inactive. Correct. If okay. they are in our in, in our Compass database, mm -hmm. correct, they would be. So, there. and you said you service sixty to. Um, that you you you're in thirty two counties, but those thirty two counties cover 60 to 65 percent of the NC FAST. Of the FNS benefits. Okay. Or F FNS caseload in North Carolina. You know, we have customers like Mecklenburg, Guilford County, um, Buncombe County. So those are three of the six largest in the state. I'm sorry, Mr. Do Mayor. you build your master client index from those three and a half by cards or is that from day forward as well? Um, we get that we get that information within FNS and Medicaid from a download from NC FAST from Data Warehouse. So well, there would be n none of that manual population. What about child welfare? Child welfare, you would have to manually enter that because and adult services. Yeah, too. we don't have that da download from the state system. Would you be able to scan in those the information that we have here? Yes, okay. we would be able, and we would talk to your staff about how in, how to do that. If you wanted to hire temporary staff to do that, you can. Um, there's services bureaus that do it. Um, so there's multiple different options. Typically, agencies do that on their own, and we would set up a taxonomy for you to do back file <coughs> scanning. Because in CPS, it's very important that you have the history of that case. Um, and that's why within economic services, typically it's just day forward. Uh, but in CPS, APS, we do promote scanning um, most of the open active case. Like I know there's a file room with oodles and oodles of old CPS and APS files. Would all of those be put into the system in the duration and then the paper purged? Um, yeah, I mean, we'd want to go through and do some analysis or those, you know, has a case been closed in there since 1960? Um, you know, it's probably not, obviously not necessary, but if it's, it's open, it's ongoing, what we do is typically, as you touch this case, scan it in at that point. Does that make sense? Well, yeah, and one thing I was wondering is, you know, generation after generation usually begets the same kind of history. Mm -hmm. And cases that were active, PS, CPS, say, in the 60s, probably will someday reappear yeah. in generational. Mm -hmm. And I was just curious, would, that, would you have access to all that background? Yeah, I mean, if you wanted to scan all of that in, that's definitely possible. Um, Robeson County, when they move forward with our, or with our solution, they were moving into a new building. Um, and instead of building an extra, I think it was 15,000 square foot file room, they actually contracted out and somebody scanned in all that information so it would be accessible. How long does it take to scan one case? I mean, I know it depends on the length of the case, but yeah, just average. Uh, typically when we're doing back file scanning, we're actually scanning at the section level, so we won't go down to the document level. So it's a, you'll get a high volume scanner, and I mean, those scanners can scan 100 pages within you know, a few seconds. I mean, it's, it's a very quick process. Ms. Darkey, in Johnston County one summer, we, we scanned 12 million pages with adolescent parents links foster kids and summer youth employment program and some of our staff. Um, it, it is doable. It's, 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 it, it's definitely, a, it's a massive undertaking. It's doable. It does take time. Um, if the business case is there, I would promote doing it. If it's not. There's um, a record it, retention schedule, yeah. though, that when you can destroy or not. But from my experience, you're better not off not. Um, going from day forward with the public assistance stuff because you can do download as much, but you would probably want to scan more of your um, services information because it, it's not available anywhere else. 
You said how long does it take? Is that? Mm -hmm. it, oh, okay. I, but we did 12 million Very pages in about how long? Three or four months. That's wild. That's quick. Yeah. And it was a rather inexpensive way because if you hire it done, it's what, usually 20, 25 cents a page? Yeah. Is that correct? It could get pretty expensive. And, and then you saved on uh, not building an extra file Space room? Space and all yeah. yeah, I mean, th that was Robeson County. They were obviously moving into a new building, so they were weighing the cost of, do we scan all of this or do we build that 15,000 square foot file so room? So we'd almost get another office or two. Yeah. Or the size of the file rooms. Mm -hmm. yep. Mr. Drayback, it's my understanding that Dr. Vosch has said that she's not, she's not sold on the um, developing this uh, services component yeah. in the NC fast and she's looking at other companies to possibly contract with and maintain on a statewide basis uh, have you been approached um, we have not I, um, as we talked about earlier I did when mr. black Wayne black um, was the director at Surrey County he actually bought com our compass system from us um, so he's very familiar with Northwoods um, we are going to approach him to see if there is an interest in Northwoods for CPS at the state level um, obviously, the challenge there is, you know, it would take a couple year procurement, RFP, stuff along those lines. But we are open to those conversations. We do have statewide projects in other states like Louisiana, Maryland, West Virginia, and Nevada. Um, it's just here our business model has been working with each independent county. A um, couple things I want to show you. Uh, tracking. Application. So this is our task tracker, and once again, I do apologize. Um, this is how workers really organize their day. A lot of times, if you go into a worker's office or cubicle, you'll see they have a calendar on their desk with, you know, things they need to follow up with or a date drawer, and they put I items in there they need to follow up with that. Well, this helps organize them. This can be document-centric or client-centric activities. So as I mentioned, a report comes in um, that needs to be followed up within 48 hours. It would go to that investigator's task tracker. Um, we could assign the 48-hour follow-up with it, and if it's not followed up on that, you can see my first task here is highlighted in red. That's an overdue task um, within our system. So Tamitha, Margaret, as supervisors um, of those units would be able to monitor their workers' task to make sure everything is being processed in a timely um, and orderly fashion. And it really helps them. We can set priorities where they are in the process, assign in progress, complete. Um, notes if there's additional information needed on that task as well um, so those are all part of the system um, you know I want to show you real quick if we just come in here and do a general search for information um, you know once again working with Henry Anderson so I could just type in his social security number bring back a hit list of all the documents related to Henry um, you know if I can click on one I could see it there I get the image on the right hand side um, I can detach the image if Henry moves from Pitt County to um, Washington County. I can burn all these images to a CD, send the CD instead of making copies of that entire case record and mailing that over there. Um, you know, once again, all the tracking's in here, so we can. Each run. individual worker would be able to do that, or who would have that ability to make Typically that? Typically, that's permission based, so uh -huh. we would, through the business process discovery, determine who would have the eligibility to burn a CD or burn images to a CD and send that CD. So you may have a person. That's that their designated responsibility. Um, the final thing is the forms that we have, our forms application. This provides the agency a centralized repository of all the forms, so nobody's saving modifications of forms locally on their desktop. Everybody's using the most up-to-date, newest form. Um, so if I just pull up a form here, I'll pull up a request for information, um, open that up. Um, this is where we're working with Charlotte Best on this one. I just double-click on her information. It pre-populates that client demographic information that we know. Um, and then we can go through, there would be Topaz signature pads so the client could actually digitally sign the form. Um, they're free flowing so I can type in any information here. Um, couple features, control D populates today's date and then I would just continue to work down the form. Um, there's a box down here to type additional information. Um, it's a multiple page form. So good quick way to save workers on forms that they repeatedly handwrite or type in that same information over and over again, we can actually automate that task for them. Um, and I know how, how easy is it to add a, maybe a section to a form or, um, or a new form? Um, very easy. We actually provide a design utility. 
Um, and we train some of your subject matter expertise here in-house, so they would have the ability to modify forms, create new forms. Um, we would also share with you, so CPS, um, we're working on with the Cabarrus County right now, so we would be able to bring their state forms with us, and then we would train you how to design your own local county forms. Um, real quick, last thing I want to show um, within the <coughs> last few minutes is uh, just a mobile tablet application that the social workers uh, would have the ability to Um, sorry, I'm mirroring my iPad onto my um, desktop here. But the mobile app tablet application, here it is. So I um, do apologize for the view here. But we would be able to load the client's information from the infrastructure here through the cloud and sync it onto the tablet device. Um, and this allows them to have all the utilities that they have at their desktop out in the field so they can begin that data collection as they're at the home, doing an investigation, do a family assessment, whatever it may be. Um, so as you can see here, Charlotte Best with her daughter, Ima. Um, I can look at any previous documents. Um, I can load or I can add new documents while I'm out in the field. Here's a photo um, from the last visit. I can add a caption onto that photo. Um, if I want to add a new photo for this particular um, engagement, I just select the document type. We already know who we're meeting with, and then I would proceed with taking that photo, um, whether it's living conditions, injury. Um, we also have, we can do audio recording of conversations as well. Um, all the forms that we would need. Um, so if I need to add a new form for this particular type of, we'll just select the body diagram. You can see down here, Charlotte Best's information is loaded already. The workers would have a stylus with this device so they could circle um, the areas where abuse is reported, um, and then actually have the parent, guardian, sign that form right out in the field with them. Um, one of the cool things Beaufort County is doing is actually they use Skype. So when they're in a Wi-Fi enabled area, they actually Skype with their supervisor. So they're doing a peer review. So the social workers out in the home conducting the client, in conducting the client interview, the uh, supervisor's back at their agency, and there's real-time peer interaction. They can also get real-time feedback from the supervisor, whether they may need to remove the kid what a correct, corrective action plan may be, mm -hmm. things along those lines. Um, and then we also have the ability to take notes as well. Um, we promote a Bluetooth keyboard so they could type those notes um, right there on the keyboard as they're going through that client interaction. So you know, don't want to take up any more time. I know you guys have a full agenda. Um, we'll open it up to questions. I know sometimes I talk fast, so if there's anything um, you, know, you think I missed or any questions that you have, um, be more than willing to address those at this point. I, I have one. Since this is part of the scope of work for NC Fast, what will the federal government participate? Um, we which actually parts, have which parts of it will. It yeah, so there's several parts that are reimbursable. First is the hardware. Um, the Compass Capture software is reimbursable, along with software maintenance on that and professional services. And then the underlying document repository. Um, laser fish is also reimbursable as well. So I think it equates to about 40 to 45 percent of the project is reimbursable. Um, working with the county in the central part of the state um, that actually just got their reimbursement approval back March 6th. Um, so th there is definitely components of this that are eligible. Worked with Margaret on putting together a reimbursement letter to go to Hank Bowers. Um, so that would provide the, the uh, county with a more detailed description on the total amount that is eligible. <coughs> I, I think um, Eugene, you had asked about the price was. Oh yeah. yeah. Well, I'm going to depend a great deal upon Michael that he's taking all this in. So <laughs> <laughs> I can, you can rest assured that a lot of us are going to. He's an expert. I can He is. I got to spend an hour so with he, him. So he, he's what uh, I'm going to yeah, be yeah. looking at. And yeah. He provided. He will have all of okay. this information. I'm sure for us. All right. and, and if this is staff's recommendation, I assume it comes forward in your budget proposal this spring and Mike can speak to the, the fact that you know there's it depends on there's some options here and, and he certainly can you know outline what those options are it isn't like you have to you know get the whole enchilada or nothing you know there's ways to roll it out 
you know, in a planned way and build on it from year to year. So Mike certainly, I think, is willing to put out some of those options I mean, to look this, at. If this is what staff thinks is a viable solution, I guess as one board member, I just want to know you are planning to include it in your budget and articulate that I put desire. it in mind as a consideration. Okay. Uh, okay. Now, where it goes, where it goes right. beyond that. We'll consider it. <laughs> well, I hope Mike I his, his outfit will be consulted all along anyway, Bob, of course. Okay. But he's the one that I look to, I know. And he's going to recommend, I think, what's best for the social service and for Pitt County. I really do. Okay. And I think um, you, you're going to tell him about staying around. Yeah, I, okay. I'm going to hang around till about 4 o'clock, so if you do have any questions you want to take offline, um, I'll be available to address those questions. Um, sincerely appreciate the time again today. Um, didn't want to overfill you with information, just wanted to really highlight on how easy our system is to use, um, exposure that we have across the state. Would encourage you to, if you have the opportunity and want to learn more um, about how social workers use our solution on a day-to-day -day basis, you know, go visit Beaufort County. Um, I know Sonia Toman, the director there, is very open to have anybody come visit and also Jim Chrisman the assistant county manager um, speaks very highly of our solution and they were part of um, the NACO award presentation th this summer um, and Beaufort County received that, that award from NACO for advancements in human services technology related to our project. Okay. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. Right. Again. Thank you very much for that. It's very informative. Um, just going to go to the um, added uh, agenda item. Um, uh, wh what we do is we do have a uh, pool of candidates and that the interview process is uh, proceeding. And I just wanted to just mention that. Okay. All Next. right. <clears throat> I included a daycare report for some of my recommendations uh, at the request of the county manager. Um, that's just for you to look and see how much we expended Representative Brian Brown came by and he was concerned that we had we had uh, sent six hundred thousand dollars back to the state. Um, the, I, I probably give some people a uh, little heart palpitations with some of these suggested expenditures to start with and whatever, but that has been the way I have found it to be successful to spend the majority of your daycare money. Um, I'm not asking unless you want to do it today, but the first thing I would add the eight-year-olds back on. The second thing I would raise expenditures from now through September uh, to 600000 a month, if that was possible. 550000 is what you have budgeted per month, but we're, we're behind, and it takes two or three months to ever catch up to the level you need to be with when you're that far behind. Um, if we go over, do we have to give money back? Well, that number four, oh, okay. number three, mm -hmm. that we would do quarterly reviews. Mm -hmm. And that way you get people who are no longer eligible after the first week. Sometimes people get on, they go to work for a week, they quit, they leave their children in until we end up doing, if we do an annual review, we find that if you do quarterly reviews, you find those people and you clear them out and you have more space for people that are in need. Um, I would budget a couple of hundred thousand dollars of the TANF maintenance of effort money that we're required to spend um, just as a hedge against overspending. But it's been my experience that we get the county, the state, to give counties that are overspending, um, they reallocate the underspending counties' money to the to the overspending county's money, and you get you end up with more money uh, rather than giving your money away. All right, why did we send any money back? Yes, sir. We sent six hundred thousand well, dollars. Well, I'm a board member. Leave that up to you all. Now it's been the policy that we we don't spend. I don't spend send money back to the state. Why wasn't it spent? Why wasn't uh, it, you might say, lower to the eight-year-old, uh, uh, Brian, and uh, to use this money uh, for these children? Why didn't we send it back? Well, that that daycare is not part of my division. Oh, so well, I, I mean, who? I, I don't care. To, I can't speak to that. Uh, I, I don't care who. Well, who uh, my is? My understanding was that 
that when it was lowered to the seven-year-olds, um, that w the Pitt County was overexpending significantly at yeah, that we, time, and that the state came in and said, "Come up with a plan yeah. to lower your spending." And yeah. I'm sure you remember that. Well, I certainly do, because I was—we were begging for money, more money to take it to get more money to come back to Pitt County, right? Or daycare. Jay. And what happened was, in order to get back down to where we had to get because we were so heavily overspending, we started off the new fiscal year. Last fiscal year, we were way, way, way up, way up because of what we did. So, so we had to come back down. So when this new fiscal year started, we were very, very low. And we've been working ever since to bring it back up. And they've been sending out hundreds, a couple hundred letters each month to, for students, to, for people to come in to get on on uh, daycare. Now, uh, it takes, as he said, it takes about three months to get them on, and we're probably not going to see the whole result of what we have done through this month, but next month you're going to see a pretty pretty hefty increase in, in what our spending, and we've, we're working our way back up. Well, I know I used to ask, we weren't serving, we had a long waiting list. Yes, sir. I know. The waiting list, I think, today I saw something was down to like 883, I think, right. for, for this month. But it, it, it was a combination. It was sort of the perfect storm all hit at one time. You know, we were way, way overspending, and, and the state made us do this plan as he was talking about it. You guys were here. You heard all about yeah. it at the time. Mm -hmm. And it's just this this fiscal year has really been a recovery to get back to where kind we needed to go. It's, it's a, a realignment like. Why thing. isn't that committee meeting each month? To, to, because they're coming off, if we do it right, some of them going to be coming off every month because of the age limit. Why aren't they meeting so that we know what we're doing as far as the numbers are concerned? Sir, we are. We, we, well, we are. Uh, but you, you cannot, you, you don't know who's going to come off. At, you know if they're eight years old. They're eight, off, we know but, those. But the others that don't. Until until the end of the month, you don't know who all is being canceled during during but, the month. Because you know we were serving the eight, we dropped it back down to seven because we eight. had. You know eight. one thing it's about the subsidized tumbles. system. Mm -hmm. You know this is March, and we're working on service month of February. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You won't even know your February numbers till the end of March, which has always been a drawback. You know in planning yeah. and uh, for the even for a year in the program. I will say that in the the t over 20 years that I have been doing daycare, um, this is a new experience for us. As you remember, we, an we uh, during the economic downturn, we took the million dollars of stimulus money and successfully yeah. spent that. I do agree with PJ that, you know, this is a realignment year for us. Uh, it is in our typical uh, way of doing business is I agree with you to send any money back yeah. Yeah. and um, we so I, I, can't, we, <laughs> I would say it's more atypical than a typical situation right. yeah. so. you yeah. know we met over at the church yeah. with all of these daycare workers mm -hmm. we had them to come from Raleigh right. we begged money we got extra money to come to Pitt County so that we could serve more right. of our for the daycare right we didn't we, we didn't, did that we didn't arbitrarily return money to the state they took it from us but it goes back to the fact where I said where we had to lower ourselves down when we had that big meeting at the church because we were so overspending. We had to get back down within the right realm of spending, and that's what we did. It takes a year to But it's let, taken, let, but we haven't, re, we haven't well, recouped. Let, 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 let me, let me, let me yeah. say, too, that the state during that year, when they got the additional dollars back from you, took the state money out of the pot and use, only used the federal money to try to balance their budget, and that's mm -hmm. why there wasn't as much money. We kind of overcorrected to try to deal, to deal with that situation. This is the plan I, I propose and to be able to deal with it in the future so we can stay very close to, right. to what we have budgeted. Yeah. And, I, and, and mm -hmm. it, it has proven successful in the past. You may not want to do 600,000, you may want to do 575 or something to start with, but you can start out getting at 600,000 and yeah. especially for whatever the rest of this year because the money will be, be available. And if you do quarterly reviews, people will come off and you can adjust your spending downward with the goal of spending all of it by next June. You don't think, want to apply for less than what you want. You want to apply for more. 
Well, Mark, it's an allocation process. Yeah. It's based on a formula, you know, for every county. So it isn't an application that's made or a request that, you know, that we have a certain amount of money. It's based on a formula. And um, I was on that formula committee. All right, what's well, right. That, that, that was that right. was right. that was developed, and we'll, we'll, Pitt we'll, County, we'll Pitt, Pitt County does not get, children do not get an equal share of this money as they do in Durham, and Wake, and Guilford, and the very large counties because they overspended way back when, and they got additional allocations, and their allocations were 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 increased. Yeah, that's why. They were held harmless when they did this allocation. They are starting to look at it again, which conceivably Pitt County could get additional dollars to. Yeah. If, yeah. if they take the whole harmless away. I think one of the things that happened is that if it, the way I see it is that the state said we need to make some changes. Oh, we yeah, made the changes nice. and the state said, oh, that's really great. And then what happened is we got dinged because we did too good of a job in a sense. The, the, the same has, thing happened to Johnston County, and they mm -hmm. had been a traditional overexpenditure and got reallocations every year. And when the we state, you, on the state. old system, used to used to spend high in the front front mm -hmm. part of the year because sure. you didn't. But sure. when they when they're nice enough to give you money and they want to reallocate and they give it to you in April and the yeah. year's over in May, I mean that's kind of like yeah they did yeah as I recall yeah. they you did. don't even have a, an opportunity <clears throat> to spend the money yeah they gave they gave us money late Eugene that's, I was saying that, they gave us money late so it was harder to spend right. because oh, we yeah, got it later okay. that, that's the point of if having we, if we've some got of that. it solved now that's what I meant okay no, all know. right I think we do all right not we do about that but we want to make sure we get it corrected in. But, but you all feel good that you have something in place to yeah. start ratcheting it back down so that you're not setting yourself up exactly. to overspend mm -hmm. in 14 15. Correct. right that's that's mm -hmm. the whole point of what I, mean, I understand the on. spin to to reach your goal for yeah. 13 but how 14, to maintain that. But yeah. then how do you sort of taper it back down in the new year yeah, that, right. yeah that's that's where we're headed I don't think we're going to hit the new year so far up there that you know <laughs> that will we, have that big award which though. we did last fiscal year we, we were going we were spending two hundred thousand dollars a month more than we should have been mm -hmm. straight line and that's why we had to take such drastic drastic measures to get down I just want to make sure you all felt good about the ramp up and then the taper off mm -hmm. well, yeah mm -hmm. when and, and you that's know, yeah the, discussion on eight and nine year olds when we did that plan with the state our letter does say that we can add back the eight and nine year olds based on the available funding so I, you know I'm I, I, we should have a better picture of it as to next we, month mm -hmm. that, that's, that's what we're interested in too okay NC As I said, we have been we have been um, counting the actual um, this is the sheet. applications and reviews that have been done. Um, that's in the bottom part of this. The first is comparison with four other um, like size counties with like size caseloads and the number of workers that they have. Um, it's my opinion that the state as a whole does not have capacity to do the exist the increasing caseloads and uh, increasing complexity of tasks with NC fast right now because it's still in the development process um, we were supposed to hard launch in January if I'm not mistaken we do not even have a hard launch for Medicaid at this date um, they did not do reviews, you know, you take an application six months later, you do a review on a Medicaid case. They delayed the, the, the reviews for January and February to March and April. So you have double the reviews to do each month. Used to, you had to do one action on a review. Now you have to do the review, do a MAGI, MAGI application, which is the modified adjusted gross income part of the Affordable Care Act. You have to close that out in the old eligibility information system, and you have to add it in. We also have those um, another round of federally mandated FNS cases that are due March the 31st. Um, 
good news on on that part is that this morning we had 46 untimely um, applications and some of those are really not untimely the the system we might have put the entered the application twice inadvertently and that's showing things untimely when the case is actually doing uh, given benefits and we only had um, five overdue um, expedited recertification so they've done a wonderful job with that um, we're gonna have zeros right Brian when correct when when March the 31st comes on and you're not gonna see Pitt County's name on that list um, but we we have been looking and <clears throat> we had pending applications 309 food and nutrition services and 2063 as of February the 17th and we had a total 4581 reviews with um, food nutrition and Medicaid 217 and and this now we've received an additional 714 applications so we we had 7,667 to do, and we did 2,874, with a total number left to be processed of 4,793. Um, our staffing, our staffing levels, are not sufficient to be able to catch up with doing this. We want to, we want to, we want to review them another month and make a recommendation. Now. Um, I met Margaret introduced me to Mary Paramore and Neil Anderson. She's with Pitt Community College. Neil Anderson is Department of Commerce, used to be ESC. I guess is why the unemployment office anyway, as they say. Um, Mary is developing a course for us at Pitt Community College. <clears throat> it will be 40 hours. They will do profiling on them and see if the people are capable of doing this type of work. Um, the course, and we did it in Johnston County too, and they're really excited about what they're getting out of the, the people they're getting. Um, they will do that course. We will have to pay 25% of the tuition for the people after they're screened and they put in there. Then they will provide um, people would go into temporary positions. I thought we would have what you call a temp internship, but they have federal money that will pay 75% of the people that we train. Um, I don't know how many they have in a course that's usually about 15. So you would get people that have been screened to see if they can do this type of work. People that we train to do it for six months, paying a 25% match. You have to pay salary and benefits but a uh, 25% uh, match. And that lasts up to six months. And then you have permanent positions. You, you know you know which ones you want, and that's a sustainable process where you can keep, you can keep the work, the labor force that you're going to need. Say if we needed an additional 30 employees, and I, I don't rule that out in that area. It would give you a way of training them yourself getting other, other financial participation to help us do it and gradually phase them in as opposed to bringing a whole bunch of new people in, having to try to train them all at one time and have chaos when you're trying to do it. So this, I'm, really, I'm really excited about it. Will this include on board staff as well? No, it, it's Just board new, new potential new. Be, it's OJT money under Workforce Investment Act is, is what the, ma the match is. Uh, should we contact other counties, uh, especially like Green County, to let's not have a community college and you get them involved? Or? It's a possibility. Um, you know, if we did it in Johnson County the first time. We had 13 people to come in. 13 people finished the course, which is pretty unusual. They had 11 interns that they have, and, and they're, they're just thrilled about all of them. It's my understanding that that money's come from different, there are different workforce areas or whatever. So say Lenora wanted to get in on it and send some students up here, yeah. then they would have to, they would have to pay to match for their people. 
and they would have to get the OJT and the Workforce Investment Act money from, from, from their county. But the, the exciting thing to me is that this is a huge growth area all over North Carolina. People, unfortunately, it's been my experience that people that have worked in the system a long time and, and retired <coughs> have a very difficult time with this new system. Um, this is a way to find people with two years degrees in uh, medical technology and secretarial science and a lot of those areas that can't find jobs to go out there and they know who they are and go out there and recruit those people in to come take this 40 hour course and move, move them into it and you get you get an orderly way of bringing on staff you get more per financial participation in doing it to start with and when you finally put them on a permanent job in Pitt County you got somebody that you completely vetted and you know that they're going to be good employees and they're productive that's what we need a guidance council so for each of our high schools to be involved in the project because they can advise and get you good students I think it's a possibility that we could maybe refer some of our work first clients yeah. clients to that too so right. um, I, good. Um, these people have been great to work with and they're working on it um, it's not finalized yet they have he has to get his board to approve the funding for us tomorrow morning that's that's how it's planned um, I think that gets to a, a couple of issues that we had talked about. Uh, one is the, uh, the way we fill our openings, finding new people, and certainly cutting down the training time, which we were all very much um, concerned about. Um, I really think that was a good idea, and thanks a lot, Margaret, in terms of introducing people and kind of uh, getting him to know the, the particular people. You know, appreciate that because um, what we have is an untapped uh, resource and uh, we're able to get people in from the county, get them working and make the transition again from student to uh, worker. Very smooth. As you said, we have these people vetted. We know how good they are. We know what they can do and they're up to speed and they're running pretty much right away. And if we need something temporary, we can bring them in fairly quick as well. Yeah. You said 40 hours but uh, for, uh, for two years, but normally that's... No, you sir, the, the initial training <coughs> at the community college is 40 hours. All right. And then we get that's them about, over here uh -huh. in, a, in a, what they call a full-time position, but we call it a temporary position, except they'll have to get benefits. We get them over here in the temporary position and, and continue on training them. Some of them can last up to six months, some of them a little less, depending right. on how they're set. Okay, that's why we can kind of get them. Mm -hmm. I know like you need to get a BS degree from East Carolina, you like got to have 140 hours, 160, it depends upon the And it could be, be people with four-year degrees that can't yeah. find a job anywhere, and that's something that they're interested in doing, yeah, well, and they can't find the employment. Field. It'll be, be based on what their previous employment was, too. So I think it'll be pretty popular Oh, if I people um, good job opportunities right Did you have something? You something? okay you can move down to the um, telephone report next is that what we're moving to next well, we have, you have your set personnel. vacancy here okay and uh, we have what three frozen positions two of them are child support agents and um, I I talked to Mr. Elliott about that, and he's going to relook at those, um, given the funding. It's one third funding um, that's county funding, and then incentive money. Child support has to meet five goals to receive their maximum incentive money, and um, since it's one third county and two thirds federal money, um, and then incentives paying part of that out there's not much savings from from freezing those and we can't meet our incentive goals so we lose incentive money because of that so he he he, he I talked to him and he's gonna take another look at those um, the others the social work supervisor three and that's just a recent um, and I'll let you speak to that one Margaret yeah she left recently and you all know who that is Mildred Daniels and um, <clears throat> so it'll be a while before we can advertise that position so 
um, one of Mildred's staff is uh, helping out in that regard, and I really appreciate her, Joy Boykin, stepping up to the plate and um, doing some of those duties till we get that filled. Um, and we're in the process of, you know, interviewing for the rest of the positions that we have vacant in child welfare. So, and one position in daycare due to Naomi Dickens' retirement. You have your telephone call mm -hmm. here, and you know, that's the reason we think we need a hunt group. If you look mm -hmm. at 2 million, 393,000 calls last year and 207,000 in January and 145,000 in February. Um, we have to do it a different way. Oh, yeah, I agree. Yeah. Definitely. And mm -hmm. uh, it's my concern that we miss out on child welfare reports. Yep. Um, I understand we have some kind of line that they can do, but they leave a message, and that scares me half to death, too. So if we can get these answered, and make sure that every call comes through and every call is answered. I think we can serve our citizens a lot better and reduce a whole lot of frustration that people That would be huge. Yeah. Well, I mm -hmm. think this hunt group will do it. Um, it. It's worked very well in the past, and Michael has helped us out a whole lot in that, and we're moving right along. I think that'll be the part. It's on us now to go ahead and set up the, the, the mini hunts. Mm -hmm. hunt groups within the agency and I think we'll be pretty much yeah, ready to go. Good. So I, I'm really excited about that. Mm -hmm. okay. Okay. Yeah. I had uh, right on the top of this I had where, is, where are we on the hunt group and I crossed that out since we had got to it. I think that's going to be very important um, because what's going to happen is people can get information in a lot quicker a lot of concerns can be dealt with a lot quicker. I think it's going to lower a lot of the uh, frustration that uh, we may have seen in the past. Okay. Um, uh, let's see now, Susan, do I need to make a motion first, or do you need to read the information first? I think I need to make the motion yeah. that we go into closed session, and then you read. Hey, I'd like to get a motion. I move that we go into closed session, Mr. Chairman. And I second that. Motion. Yes. Motion has been made and seconded. All those in favor say aye. aye. All those opposed? Okay. North Carolina <clears throat> General Statute 143-318.11 regarding closed sessions. Section A, permitted purposes. It is the policy of this state that closed sessions shall be held only when required to permit a public body to act in the public interest as permitted in this section. A public body may hold a closed session and exclude the public only when a closed session is required to prevent the disclosure of information that is privileged or confidential pursuant to the law of the state or the United States are not considered a public record within the meaning of Chapter 132 of the General Statutes to consider the qualifications, confidence, performance, character, fitness, conditions of appointment, or conditions of initial employment of an individual public officer or employee or prospective public officer or employee or to hear or investigate a complaint, charge, or grievance by or against an individual public officer or employee. Okay. Um, so I guess we go into closed session now. Do I need to do anything else?